honored to have Professor Bernard Harcourt uh, help us uh, read Through Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison by Michel Foucault. Professor Harcourt is the Isidore and Seville Sulzbacher Professor of Law and also Professor of Political Science at uh, Columbia University. He's also the uh, Executive Director of the Eric Older Initiative for Civil and Political Rights at uh, Columbia, and he's the Director of the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought. Um, as you know, uh, he is a reader, editor, commentator of Michel Foucault. He has um, um, published, uh, he has edited uh, some of the, um, some of Michel Foucault's uh, Collège de France lectures, La Société Punitive uh, in particular, uh, and um, he has also, is a co-editor of uh, Mal faire dire vrai, um, uh, which was published uh, in, in 2012, it's a Foucault's text published in 2012. Uh, he has written extensively about uh, you know, crime and punishment, uh, and uh, on um, a lot of other issues, uh, but I'm going to keep it to uh, the question of, of criminality. He has written a book called Against Prediction, Punishing and Policing, Policing in the Actual Age, that was published in 2007, and um, uh, Language of the Gun, Youth, Crime and Public Policy, that was published in uh, 2005. He is also a professor in Paris at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, and um, he has been a active, uh, he's been active as a, as a defender, as a lawyer. He has uh, represented and continued to represent um, death row inmates in uh, Alabama, and uh, for that work he has received the uh, 2019 New York City Bar Association Normal, Norman Redrich Capital Defense Distinguished Service Award. Uh, I could go on and on, but I won't. Uh, I would just thank very much Professor Arco for being us today to, um, to help us with Michel Foucault. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Emmanuel, and welcome, everyone. <clears throat> So I thought I should start with the simplicity of the book, Discipline and Punish. Because oftentimes readers find it hard to understand the book and are perplexed by it. But I think we should start with the utter simplicity of the book to understand its arc. This is a story in three parts, in three historical parts. It's a, it's a classic social theory in the sense that it's a story about before and after a significant change. The first part, the first historical period, is the classical period, the period of the Ancien Régime, the period of the brutal, brutal punishments uh, that are called les supplices. The brutal punishments that are represented, of course, by this first image, and by the opening of the book, the execution of Damien in 1757. This is a time at which sovereign power is exercising itself and marking the body in these excruciatingly brutal forms of punishment. The second period is a time in the 18th century when there's a reform movement towards punishment. It is a time that's marked by thinkers like Cesare Beccaria and others who, d who oppose these forms of torture and executions and envisage a much, more, a much more just society with less harsh punishments. The third period is the modern period in the 19th century. And it is the period described, of course, in the second major metaphor for discipline. It's the case of Maitre, a juvenile facility, a juvenile home, school, where everything and all the forms of punishment are so deeply disciplined with the timetable that you read that opens up the book. Now, the story of discipline and punish is a story that tells us how we moved from a period of such brutal corporal punishments to this 
mode of disciplining individuals as a way of, of punishing them, surveilling them, of turning them into docile bodies. Now, part of the arc of the story is to suggest that for all of those who thought that the reformers brought about these more acceptable and humane forms of punishment, don't be fooled. What we learn to do from that first period to the last is not to punish less and not to be more humane, but to punish better. And in a sense, the, the simplicity of the story is that we've come to a point today where we punish through modes of discipline, or at least in 1840, when we punish through modes of discipline that we don't view as brutal, but that are so much more deeply ingrained in every interstices of society, in what Foucault will call the carceral society that we live in today. So that is the simplicity of the arc of this book. And what it tries to show then, as a social theory does, a social theory shows a before and an after and a transformation in society, what it tries to show is the changed ways in which power circulates in society. Right? Uh, new forms of exercising power develop uh, in the 19th century. New forms of exercising power that are represented really by this image that I hope you can see, this image of a tree that is being forced to be straight, right? And this kind of discipline is what he calls an orthopedics of power. And the idea is not to take trees and just find the ones that are straight, but that every tree can be made to be straightened. Every one of us can be made to be docile subjects by means of discipline. And this is a form of power that he discerns emerging uh, in the beginning of the 1800s, in the beginning of the 19th century, emerges as a way that power now circulates in society. Now, it's important to understand that one of the chief contributions of this book has to do with the fact that he develops as a result of this study of the different way in which power circulates in society, he develops a new theory of power. And that in a sense is probably the crown accomplishment of discipline and punish and what has transformed the way we think about power today. One could think of Hobbes as having been the one who perhaps put into place a notion of sovereign power, a notion of sovereign power that you find very much in the supplice of the Ancien Régime. But at the other bookend today, we have Foucault's theory of power, which views it in a very fundamentally different way, not as something that is exercised by a sovereign on its subjects, not as something that is uh, 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 held or possessed, but as something that circulates around us within which we exist, within which we live, within which, within which essentially we exercise our relations, our social relations. Now, you get a sense of this new theory of power very clearly in Discipline and Punish on page 27 of your text. I hope you have your texts in front of you and you can follow along. It's on the bottom of page 27, where he writes, Now, the study of this microphysics presupposes that the power exercised on the body is conceived not as a property, but as a strategy. That its effects of domination are attributed not to appropriation, but to dispositions, maneuvers, tactics, techniques, functionings. That one should decipher in it a network of relations. And he writes, in short, this power 
is exercised rather than possessed. It is not the privilege acquired or preserved of the dominant class, but the overall effect of its strategic positions. It is not exercised simply as an obligation or a prohibition, and it goes right down, he writes on page 27, into the depths of society. Now, this is a theory of power that he had developed during the beginning of the 1970s, and he had developed it specifically in his lectures at the Collège de France titled The Punitive Society. And it's there in The Punitive Society uh, on March 28, 1973, that he says, it's now time to talk about this power. Okay? And he goes through four different schemas of how we have thought about power and he offers his own. First, he says, the theoretical schema of the appropriation of power, that is to say that the idea that power is something that one could possess, that the bourgeoisie would possess. He says, that's all wrong. Power is not possessed, and it's not possessed for many reasons because it is exercised in all its depths. Second, he says, the schema of the localization of power, Political power is always located in a society in a certain number of elements in the state apparatuses in the state, in other words. He says, no, it's not always located in the states. It's, it's as you will learn, capillary. It goes through all of society. Third, the schema of subordination, according to which power is a certain way of maintaining and reproducing a mode of production. Power is always subordinate then to a mode of production. He says, no. In fact, no, power is an exercise. We all are engaged in it. We all are engaged both in forms of power and in existence at all times. Fourth, says, the schema of ideology, according to which power can produce only ideological effects in the realm of knowledge. And he says, no, this isn't just an ideological production. What he develops then is and um, let me see. Some can we mute some of the some of the some of the uh, mics? Okay, great. Thank you so much. He develops a theory of power that becomes known and that he himself calls and gives the name of knowledge power. Right, and you get a very good flavor and a very good sense of it on the bottom of page twenty-seven of Discipline and Punish, where he writes. Perhaps, too, we should abandon a whole tradition that allows us to imagine that knowledge can exist only where the power relations are suspended. We should abandon the belief that power makes mad. We should admit, rather, that power produces knowledge, that power and knowledge directly imply one another, that there is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge. And he calls this the knowledge power relations. Now, that is one of the main and most important contributions of this book, which is the following, that we can't think of knowledge or science itself as being in some way We cannot think of uh, knowledge or science as being divorced from power. There is no neutral science. All science and all knowledge are themselves intricately related in relations of power that make them possible, believed, understood, used as weapons in our social relations. And of course, that's a, a radical, a radical view. A radical view that, that frankly, would be anathema to most scientists and to many thinkers, to most social scientists, um, and to most people on campus. Right? The idea that is actually that that this knowledge is not pure in some sense or divorced from power relations, but is itself the product of power relations and is itself in play in power relations at every moment is incredibly destabilizing for an institution that seeks tr truth. Now, let me then summarize 
the basic argument of the book. The idea is that we didn't move from a barbaric period of brutal punishments to an enlightened period uh, where we punish uh, much more leniently. We've moved from a period that was viewed as barbaric to a period where we punish better. And we do it through these forms of discipline that are written throughout the book, these forms of, 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 uh, of, of timetables and grids and, and uh, assortments of places and normalization, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. And this was not the product of the reformers from the 18th century. In other words, it's not the case that what we got was a more lenient and a, 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 a more humane society as a result of the reformers of the 18th century. In fact, something completely different happened. Um, and it's very important to the story that uh, Beccaria, for instance, and those 18th century reformers uh, are actually not the ones who achieved this transformation of society. It's important because if they had, then we could simply have an archaeology uh, of this transformation, he says. But we, we can't have a simple archaeology of this transformation. We need a genealogy of this transformation, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, the book itself, then, if you look at your, if you look at your uh, table of contents, you can see exactly where all of this is happening. Okay? And it's helpful in this book to maybe recategorize the parts of this book and to give them new names, but also uh, to identify them uh, well. The, the first chapter, of course, with the Damien and Mitre and the kind of the entire theory that comes out, the way in which we have changed the way we, we punish, the way we, we try to find out who the person is rather than what they did, etc. That's all in the first chapter, the body of the condemned. Um, in the second chapter, the spectacle of the scaffold, right, that is the early time. That is the Ancien Régime. That is the supplice and the barbarity of the Ancien Régime. So that's time one, as it were. Part two, which is composed of generalized punishment and the gentle way in punishment, is really time two. Uh, that is the time of the reformers. That is the idealism of the reformers. Okay, and what he tries to show there, really, is that these reformers, what they had in mind was something very different uh, than what we have today. They had in mind theaters of punishment that would correspond the exact right punishment for the crime, say, so that there would be multiple different variations in punishments, all according to the differences in the acts that were done and whatnot. And of course, what Foucault says is that that's not what happened. What happened is the prison. One size fits all. Everybody gets the same punishment. And it was not at all what the reformers had in mind. Okay? So what he has to do then is try to understand how is it that the prison, despite the fact that it's been criticized for 150 years, has lasted for 150 years and is so resilient and continues to last today. And what he then discovers, of course, is that it's not so much that the prison was born, okay? It's that discipline was born throughout society. Throughout society, we turn towards a new mode of power the new circulation of power, right, that enters the body, that goes very deep, that changes and transforms us and turns us into docile bodies. That happened across society, in the military, uh, in schools, in hospitals, and then it also happened with the prison. So what you get then, part three of the book, of course, is this production of discipline throughout society. Uh, so part three is the way in which into the 19th century, 
these modes, these techniques, these microphysics of discipline were invented and what they represent. Hierarchical observation, normalizing judgment, the examination, right? All of which he puts under the rubric of panopticism, which I'll get to in a minute. And it's only then in the fourth part of the book, titled Prison, appropriately, that he talks about the birth of the prison in the 19th century as part, though, of this transformation of society. Just one part. All of the transformations of society are captured brilliantly in these plates uh, that uh, are in the book. Not all of them are included in the English translation, um, but, uh, but they were in the French. And um, I wanted to take you through them because it gives you the idea of how discipline arrives, how it is born in a sense. Um, these are images of the military, military examinations. And of course, the idea here is that we don't create an army simply by collecting the most brutal, brutish, strongest, and um, meanest uh, people. What we do is we're going to make an army. We're going to make a soldier out of every single one of you. Because we can develop these techniques that will kind of shape your body. These are the techniques of discipline, of military discipline uh, in the 17th century, uh, of learning how to, you would repose yourself on your arm, of learning all of the different steps, the five different steps that were necessary in order to load a musket. Uh, these are all the military arts of the construction of military barracks according to certain kind of designated uh, um, uh, architectural um, and hierarchical uh, modes of observation and placement. Uh, this is the, the, the military barracks, and it goes throughout this period that we are actually learning to, to divide, to align, to shape, to, to take that crooked tree and straighten it. But it was not just in the military. It was also as a mode of writing where you would learn where you have to put your feet and your arms and how you would have to hold yourself and how you would have to hold the pen in order to draw properly or how you would need to be placed in a school, in a different position, at a desk, in all of the different possible positions that you would need to be trained to learn so that we would line you up and you would all obey. In the military, in school, in church, in hospitals, in the hospitals. And we developed this idea of creating hospitals and creating then prisons where we could line people up in certain ways so that they could be viewed centrally. Um, and all forms of kind of, of hierarchical placements that would mean that ultimately here the prisoner, but in another case, the military soldier, in another case, the factory worker, right? Could be disciplined, observed, seen, and ultimately in this way, would internalize these the gaze uh, of the person watching. This is, of course, the panoptic prison, the idea being that there is a central tower in the middle, um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that the cells are arranged around it in such a way that from the central tower, you can see in the cells, and once you can see in the cells, the prisoner at that point is internalizing the discipline, right? And in fact, you might not even need anyone in the central tower because people are gonna believe that they're being watched anyway. The story ends in 1840 in Maitre, in this juvenile facility that, that represents for him the culmination uh, of disciplinary uh, techniques. And so what we see in this story are three three important 
theoretical pieces, three important dimensions. The first is this idea of a genealogy, which I uh, referred to earlier. The second is the idea of panopticism, or the panoptic. And the third is the idea of the productivity uh, of power. So very quickly, let me go over those. Uh, in terms of genealogy, uh, the idea was that the reformers from the 19th century, from the 18th century, um, weren't, weren't the ones who made this happen. If they had been the ones who made this happen, then Foucault could have used this earlier method, what was called archaeology, which he had developed in the 1960s, uh, predominantly in uh, works like uh, The Order of Things, Les Mouris et Choses, uh, and of course his text which grew out of that, The Archaeology of Knowledge the archaeology of knowledge. We would find the layers, we could find the layers and the layers in which, which, which sedimented on top of each other. And that layer of the reformers would have sedimented and then there would have been this docile punishment. But what he wants to say is it's not at all that way. What it was was a form of ge genealogy instead. What was born genealogically was through moralization, Right, uh, the idea that we were going to learn how to treat individuals in a penitential way. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there is at the time that, at, in, in, on the one hand, this moralization of the poor that goes on that he traces. Right, it's not the, it's not the reformers, it's that. The bourgeoisie, after the French Revolution, started to moralize the popular classes, he says. They would, he would moralize them by, they, they would moralize them in these texts which treated them as fierce animals, lazy, greedy, greedy, immoral. Or the popular classes were greedy and immoral. The peasants, evil, cunning, ferocious beasts, half civilized, right? And all of these texts made them to be these lazy, evil characters that needed to be disciplined. There's this passage, actually it's the passages in uh, uh, the punitive society, where one finds, I believe, the birth of uh, discipline, the birth of uh, this genealogical approach. And it's in a fictitious conversation between the bourgeoisie and the popular classes in the, and it, this is supposed to have happened at the turn of the 18th century, after the French Revolution, essentially, where the popular classes are in this fictitious conversation, turning to the bourgeoisie and saying, look, look, we were, we were fighting together. You know, we were resisting the monarchy together. We were finding ways to uh, fight sovereign power together. And, and now you're coming down on us. Like, what is, why, why are you, why are you moralizing us in these ways? Why are you turning us into evil people when we, we work together? We were resisting together. We were fighting against monarchy together. And he says, and this is the bourgeoisie saying, he says, now you are just attacking private property. Formerly, you fought together against abuse of power. Now you are violating the law and it manifests a complete lack of morals, right? A complete lack of morals. This is the moralization of deviance, the moralization of laziness, the moralization of uh, debauchery, right? And what the bourgeois says, and this was actually written in his manuscript, it's written in his manuscript, it's brilliant. He, he didn't articulate, he didn't say it at the Collège de France, but at the end of this fictitious conversation, the bourgeois says to the proletarian class, to the, to the popular classes, it says, allez, et faites pénitence. Allez et faites pénitence. Go, do your penitence. Right? And that is, for Foucault, the birth of the penitentiary. The penitentiary, the prison. The prison, which was originally called the penitentiary, many invented by Quakers and others who were actually using a religious model of transformation and of penitence for the institution itself. He says, this is where it came from, from this moralization, and this politicization of uh, the popular classes. And he says, allez et faites pénitence, in other words, go to the penitentiary and do your penitence. <laughs>
Now, and so it's that, it's that, uh, it's that that creates this notion of genealogy. Of course, you're familiar with genealogy from Nietzsche. Foucault's genealogy is different. We could go into a long conversation about that, although it bears a similar, a similar core, which is basically that we need to find the, the, the moralizing instincts that produced our beliefs today. And so uh, discipline and punish then represents that third that second period of methodologically in his work that's called genealogy, which would then uh, later give rise to allotherogy, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, now, the second thing I wanted to say, so genealogy, panopticism, and productivity. The second is panopticism. The panoptic becomes the model of how discipline works in society. Now, this is uh, Stateville, uh, prison uh, in Joliet, uh, Illinois, where I used to take my students to visit uh, every year, and it's, it was the, it's the last standing roundhouse uh, in the uh, United States, and it was actually torn down a couple of years ago. This is the way that power works in a disciplinary society. Now, what does that mean? It's a new form, a new architecture, a new model of the way that power circulates. Because, you see, in antiquity, right, it was completely different. In antiquity, everyone lined up together in an arena or an amphitheater in order to watch one person, the gladiator in the center, or the actor. And the power went from the fact that you had to all come together like that to watch one individual. What fundamentally changed with disciplinary power is that that relationship was completely inverted. So that it's not thousands of people watching one person, but one person able to watch thousands of people. Foucault traces that to, uh, to a thinker, uh, Hans Nicolaus Julius. He does that in The Punitive Society, and then of course it becomes the uh, panopticism becomes so important in discipline and punish. This one German thinker, 1827, who had noticed this shift in architecture. And that what happens in the modern era, he says, is the reversal of the spectacle into surveillance. Right? The reversal of the amphitheater into the panopticon. Right? And, and that, is the, that is the metaphor that he uses to capture uh, this form of power, this form of discipline, um, that kind of goes ar around society, right, um, uh, at that time. And, and what it produces then uh, are these different forms of, of seeing, uh, of, of, of repartition, of hierarchy, and of normalization. Right? That's, we're trying to, the idea, and this is one of the plates, this is the first plate in the book, actually in the French book, uh, this plate appears at the very beginning. What we're trying to do is, is to normalize, make everything, everyone kind of of the same height and straight and, uh, and right. And that is the notion uh, of normalization that is at the heart. Okay, genealogy, panopticism, and productivity. It's important to understand that this book really uh, is, uh, for Foucault, it, it happens, it's, it's a transformation of his thought. And, and it happens actually in 1972 when he visits Attica uh, in the United States. Attica prison and he comes out of Attica prison there's an interview uh, that he does in 1972 and he says you know I, 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 I got it all wrong you know, I, I, I kept on talking about repression power as repression power as domination and he says no power is actually productive it's not about repression it's about the production and what we have to study is how what it produces how, what is it that this discipline uh, produces? Um, and, and, uh, and, you, and you get a very, you know, you get a full sense of that in Discipline and Punish. For instance, uh, when you look at page 220 of Discipline and Punish, right? And here he's talking about Marx. And I would say that in this period, 72, 73, he's the most Marxisant that he was, although, I mean, he was 
a member of the Communist Party in 1950, 51, 52, but then he moved away from it. But in this period, nevertheless, he's the most Marxist because he's talking about the productivity of disciplinary power. He wants to identify the way in which it shapes the body and disciplines men and women. But what he does is to say, look, you know, it, but it's part of, it's part of, a, of, of, of the accumulation of capital as well. And so on the bottom of 220, he says, if the economic takeoff of the West began with the techniques that made possible the accumulation of capital, Marx, it might perhaps be said that the methods of administering the accumulation of men made possible a political takeoff in relation to the traditional, ritual, costly, violent forms of power, which soon fell into disuse and were superseded by a subtle, calculated technology of subjection. In fact, the two processes, he writes, the accumulation of men and the accumulation of capital cannot be separated. What is he saying? Well, he's saying, this is not a, this is not a, this is not a refutation of Marx. This is saying what Marx mix, missed was that this whole business about the accumulation of capital couldn't have happened without disciplinary power. We wouldn't have had workers disciplined, made straight to work the factories if there hadn't been this turn and this invention of disciplinary power. All right, so genealogy, panopticism, and productivity. Now, very quickly, uh, I've got um, seven more minutes, so let me try and go over seven quick facts. First, you have to understand that this book should be interpreted, I, I would argue, as a critique of Western liberalism in the 1970s. It's written in 1975. It stops in 1840, right? But this idea of discipline that he finds emerging in Western modern society, he wants to say these disciplinary forms they are vicious and that we should be thinking not just about attacking the soviet union it's got a lot of problems and there's the gulag archipelago there but in western liberal societies we have our own carceral archipelago right he used that term archipelago uh, several times in the book. He uses it on page 297. He uses it on page 298. He uses it on page 301. And it's not surprising. Solzhenitsyn had just published in 1973 in French at Le Seuil, uh, the Gulag Archipelago, right? And he uses this term. It's interesting because uh, there's a myth that he had actually wanted, that, that, that it bothered him later that he had used the term and he had tried to take it out of the book, but there are no editions uh, where it was successfully taken out of the book. And what you see here is that the book functioned in a way, I would argue, as a critique of liberalism that was intended to kind of as as a, as a, as, a, as it was supposed to be in some sense the 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 valon the other the other the other part of a triptych of critiques and there would be a critique of the Soviet Union of course we know that critique but there needs to be a critique of liberal Western society as well that's the first thing the second is that what it leads to ultimately in this new conception of power is a conception of power as a civil war that relations of society are civil war and of course that's where he ends the book um he ends the book on the idea of civil war uh he says and uh he says in the penultimate paragraph at the end in this central and centralized humanity the effect and instrument of complex power relations bodies and forces subjected by multiple mechanisms of incarceration objects for discourses that are in themselves elements of this for the strategy we must hear the distant roar of the battle what he's referring to is that social power, social relations are relations of civil war, the roar of the battle. And in this, he had, um, he had started to analyze what he said was civil war. And, and, and this would be his model and his matrix in, 19, in the 1973, 4, 5 period for what relations of society are like. It's not Hobbes. It's not the war of all against all. 
because there are these factions that happen and also because it doesn't end with the Commonwealth. No, the war of all against all is the Commonwealth, right? It's not Clausewitz because it's not politics by other means, it's war by other means. And it's not Marx because it's not a class struggle of the bourgeois against the proletariat. It's a much more complex, multi-dimensional form of war uh, that is going on today. Uh, now, um, and of course, so these are these are his uh, his notes where he, he was writing for La Société Punitive, and you see, la guerre civile, guerre de tout contre les autres, de tout contre tous. That was that was what he was working with, and that was his conception. Quickly, at the time, at the same time, of course, he was deeply ingrained working on uh, challenging uh, forms of uh, incarceration. Uh, so there was a group that was called the Groupe uh, d'Information sur les Prisons that he and Deleuze, Deleuze is on in back, he's here, he's reading the manifesto of the group. And the idea was to create a, um, it was a real attack on the prison. Uh, at a time in, at least in the United in the United States, I mean, we didn't have mass incarceration. Um, uh, mass incarceration in the United States starts around 1973, so this was very, uh, very early on. But he was deeply involved in uh, an effort to to abolish uh, uh, imprisonment, to, to get rid of the prison, to challenge the prison uh, in France through the Jeep at this time. And he says in the book, you know, what I learned most about the prison, I learned. Uh, in these battles. And, and ultimately, uh, this idea that war, uh, social relations is, uh, is civil war is something that he took very seriously. In his lectures in the punitive society, he kept on talking about the fact that, you know, all of these other people think, of, talk about the stupidity of the bourgeoisie, but actually, it's not the bourgeois that are stupid. This, they, those who think that the merchants are dim-witted, that financiers are obtuse, that those in power are simply blind, they're, they're failing to understand the lucidity and intelligence of this class, which has captured and retained power in the conditions that we know. Not exactly among them. What, what is this stupidity? Actually, it's the stupidity and blindness of intellectuals who don't understand and who don't understand the stakes, right? And he writes, he didn't say this, but he writes, those who would deny this, right, are just public jokers, and they don't understand the seriousness of the struggle today. Ils méconnaissent le sérieux de la lutte. Now, um, so let me wrap up. Um, History, of course, is very important uh, for him, uh, although it's not simply a question of uh, uh, believing that the present is like the past, right? Uh, this is from The Birth of Biopolitics, where he, he, he looks back on uh, his book, On the Birth of the Prison, and he says, look, the problem is to let knowledge of the past work on the experience of the present. It's not that things are the same. It's not that Maitre in 1840 is like the prisons today, but that experience somehow has to tell us and inform us in our way of thinking. Uh, so let me just finish by um, uh, saying what happens after, essentially. Um, this particular book came out in 1975. He had done a lot of work, uh, archaeological, philosophical work uh, on, on epistemes and, uh, epis and, and what were considered ways of thinking in the 1960s. This early period in the 1970s was marked by his work on the prison mostly and uh, the history of sexuality that comes out in 76, but shortly thereafter in 78 and 79 in the security territory population, the birth of biopolitics, he starts to think that maybe there was something wrong with a discipline and, and punish. Uh, and, and I'll end here. What he, what he says basically is that it, it may, it, maybe it focused too much still on, on the harshness of these modes of governing when in fact we need to look at other forms of governing, like pastoral governing. Uh, and it, maybe it didn't focus enough on the subject and the way in which the subject internalizes uh, the discipline. And so we need to spend more time thinking about the subject, the subject of desire, uh, which he starts to explore in the history of sexuality. And so begin, there begins a transformation where basically what he turns to is forms of governing, what he calls governmentality. Um, that looks more at the way in which we implicate ourselves in our own uh, forms of, uh, of power. Uh, and that's where I'll end. Ultimately, I mean, you might, you might, you might 
think uh, this this is this is a brilliant work but you might need to rethink it you might need to rethink it because these forms of power these forms that we see in 1984 have been completely displaced today right we don't have this drab form of power which is killing desire instead we have likes on facebook and everything i mean everything is about liking things i mean we're drawn into giving all our information today in a very different way because we're carrying these colorful uh, phones all along so we have instead today something maybe different uh, and hopefully you can um, think about that and talk about that in your class thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you all right have fun discussing it thank yes. you very much so we can, we'll see you in a minute yes yes